假如失去了双手，是否还能书写？他与团队用脑机接口技术，让人脑与外部设备建立了直接交流，并首次破译了与手写笔记有关的大脑信号，使瘫痪的人实现意念书写，速度创历史记录，准确率高达百分之九十九点五。他的突破性进展。颠覆了人们过去几十年对大脑的认识，显示着人类正一步步从科幻走向现实。二零二一腾讯科学微大会，与最强大脑破译者 p e r s o n a l s h i n o i 一起聆听天宇。It's a real pleasure to be here with you today at the Tencent We Summit 2021, where I'll share with you some of our recent thinking and research on helping people who are unable to move with something that's called a brain-computer interface. And the way I became interested in this really started in early childhood, where my maternal grandfather Leslie Wolf suffered from multiple sclerosis for 40 years before he passed in the mid 80s. And throughout that time, he was not able to walk or move his arms very well, or even speak very clearly. And watching my grandmother Rosa tend to him really brought out an urge to find a way to help people who have lost a sense of independence. So what I'll be describing is some of our work on really eavesdropping in on the actual language of the brain. Reading it out and using that to help people with a range of disabilities. So, implantable medical systems have really proliferated in the last 20 years, and this cover of science from other groups really indicates that we've become very comfortable thinking about artificial knees, artificial、uh, joints, and even pacemakers. But what's on the horizon for the coming? Few decades, we believe, is really the proposition of interfacing with the brain itself. This organ that's roughly three pounds. It's rather mysterious. Understanding it is what neuroscience is all about, and then interfacing with it to help people with paralysis and other diseases and injuries could really help change the medical landscape. Now. As a way of background, several medical systems are able to write information into the brain. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if we think of what an artificial retina implant does for people who are not able to see, a tiny computer chip, much like the one in your phone or your computer, can be put into the eye where it picks up on light, just like your camera, and then it translates that light into electrical. Stimulation patterns to inject signals into the visual parts of our brain and restore a semblance of seeing. The same can be done for cochlear implants, which is probably the the most successful and widely used neural prosthetic to date. And this works by stimulating different regions along the so-called cochlea to restore a sense of. Hearing, and this is so good these days that people that are born congenitally unable to hear are even able to learn to speak. And finally, really, what's burst onto the scene in the last 10 to 15 years are what's called deep brain stimulators, which are electrodes a few inches long that are neurosurgically implanted to a deep region of the brain called the globus pallidus. And a pacemaker-like unit trickles an electrical current, and the electrical current disrupts aberrant neural activity at that location, and Parkinsonian tremor halts the moment that these systems are turned on. So these are very powerful examples of being able to send signals, electrical energy, maybe even optical energy or magnetic energy in the future into the brain to help people. Now, what about the reverse? Well, the reverse is touched upon a little bit, even with an epilepsy implant, where you are not only injecting signals into the brain, but you're reading signals out of the brain. 
and epilepsy control units are implanted since an oncoming electrical epileptic storm and then make a decision to stimulate another part of the brain to disrupt and avert the seizure altogether. And this is really a transition into a whole new class of system where we're reading signals out of the brain. And deep brain stimulators are starting to do this too, not just trickling electrical current into the brain, but reading signals out. And again, these epilepsy implants, where here you're seeing not only a stimulation electrode, but also electrodes that read signals out of the brain. Now, if we take this as background, let's envision the future here a bit. So imagine a future where it's possible to treat a wide range of neurological injuries and disease, and we can do so by recording thousands or even millions of neurons. There are about 86 billion neurons in the brain, and right now we're able to record from a few hundred or maybe a few thousand neurons. But in the future, with nanoscience and other engineering material science advances, we can record, we think, from millions. Second, we can stimulate thousands or even millions of neurons in new and exciting ways, not just electrically, but optically with so-called optogenetics and so forth. And finally, fully implantable, ultra-low power systems. So these don't need to be systems with big cables that come out to computers. They can be miniaturized, implanted next to the brain through the revolution of the microelectronics and integrated circuit chip industry. And finally, underpinning all of this is the science, the neuroscientifically uh, critical need uh, that we have to be able to understand where in the brain, how in the brain different signals are encoded. And this really gets at the heart of who we are, our entire mental lives. So we are currently focusing as a field simply on reading out signals related to how you wish to move, or how you wish to see or hear, not tapping into these other very exciting domains that are on the horizon, psychiatric diseases and disorders and so forth. Now, let's zoom in because I need to tell you about some very concrete things and hopefully explain how they work so that you have a real feeling that this is concrete. Now, millions of people, of course, suffer from paralysis, and we think that it may be possible to help them through these intracortical brain-computer interfaces. And what intracortical means is within the cortex, and the cortex is the outer couple of millimeters uh, of tissue on the brain that is evolutionarily the newest. Humans have far more con cortex than lower animals, and brain-computer interfaces simply means that we are somehow interacting signals of the brain with signals of a computer. This picture of Christopher Reeve, who in the 80s played Superman, was thrown from a horse in the mid 90s and serves as an iconic figure for what happens following a neck injury where he broke his neck or severed his spinal cord. He was no, no longer able to walk or move his arms and less appreciated, not even able to speak clearly or communicate clearly due to the need for mechanical ventilation. But it brings to mind what is really a rather age old idea of asking, can we really listen in on the activity of the brain as I've been describing, but at new and more powerful ways so that we can ask, well, does he still wish to move his arm? Maybe those signals are just not able to make it down the spinal cord or the wires, if you will, because of the injury. So let's investigate this possibility. This is a side view of the overall concept of an intracortical brain-computer interface that can be used to control prosthetic uh, arms, okay, uh, paralyzed arms and computer interfaces. And the way this works is that if we wish to reach out and pick up something, in this example, a coffee cup, okay, as many of us do each morning, we know where that cup is because we see it. And that information is brought in through the rear part of the brain. And then it's moved forward to the so-called motor cortices 
where plans and detailed command signals are sent down the spinal cord to the muscles in the arm to reach out and pick up the cup. Now, if that's no longer possible, as we've been talking, we could take a tiny computer chip, imagine something about the size of your pinky fingernail or a baby aspirin, four millimeters by four millimeters, and implanting it in the outer surface of the brain during a neurosurgery, and listening in on the individual electrical activity of single neurons. So every time one neuron wishes to communicate to another neuron, it sends a tiny electrical pulse called an action potential or spike. And when you wish to reach in different directions, these patterns change. And I'll share a little bit more about that in a moment. But we can take these electrical signals and we can compute on them, do math on them in real time. Again, just like your cell phone and your computers are doing. Those are called decode algorithms, and they can be run on custom silicon chips that are so specialized that they burn extremely small amounts of power, which isn't just good for the battery lifetime of the implantable, but it also means that there is no heating issues. Now those signals can be brought out and be used as the first example here to go ahead and stimulate different muscles in the paralyzed arm to reanimate the arm, and as shown in this picture, to be able to pick up a cup and bring it up to one's mouth and drink from it. So this is stimulating an arm that is still there and it just cannot be moved. Now another example is moving a robotic arm or a so-called prosthetic arm. And what is shown here is a person, again, attempting to move their own arm. This does not take days and weeks and months of training. You just think about moving your right arm. And if we do our job correctly, we can read out the signals and have that robotic arm move accordingly. In this case, again, to drink a cup of coffee. I guess a lot of people need a lot of coffee. So what we've been focusing in for the last decade is the third option. And this is the direct communication with computers. And the reason for this is if we pause for a moment and really ask ourselves, how much time do we actually spend any given day on our phones, tablets, computers, and so forth, it's actually a surprisingly large number. And the reason for this is that that is our interface with the world in an ever-increasing way. Uh, and it will only expand as we start thinking about things like artificial uh, reality, virtual reality, augmented reality, metaverse, and so forth. So it becomes really important to interact with computers because then they can interface with the real world and so forth. Now, how might we go about doing this? So now let me take the deepest dive and then we'll come back up and I'll show some movies of people with paralysis actually using these systems. Well, these electrode arrays that I'm showing you here uh, is four millimeters by four millimeters with 100 tiny little electrodes, each 1.5 millimeters long. And this is the workhorse currently of the field, so-called Utah Electrode Array, made by BlackRock Microsystems, okay, where we purchased them from. And they can be put into the brain and they last for several years, giving us very useful signals. So what I'm going to show you here is how this is done surgically. So if you imagine the brain, where you access the brain in a surgery, where you open up a small, uh, window onto the brain and then the electrode array is placed on the surface as shown here and then it's inserted quite quickly so as to minimize any damage into the brain the outer two millimeters or 1.5 millimeters of the brain and then the tips of these electrodes come to rest very close to individual cells individual neurons in the brain and if we look in on one of those, we can see a voltage versus time pulse. And every time you wish to move your arm, you get a different pattern of responses from different neurons. So for example, one neuron on one electrode may issue a lot of these action potentials per second, 
when you want to move your right arm to the right. But when you want to move your right arm to the left, that same neuron may not fire any action potentials. So right away you can tell we could discern left from right. Well, that's still very crude, but if you have a second neuron that tells up from down and a third that tells in from out, and by the time you get to one or 200 neurons, you're able to do not just, oh, you wanna move your arms sorta of to the right or left, but very precise velocity control of prosthetic arms or computer cursors on a screen. This is how you decode neural activity from the brain. Now, how do we get these signals out? Well, at present, each of these electrodes is wired up to a different pad on a little connector, which is very small and sits on the head, but we can imagine getting rid of that, and many efforts are underway to do that because we can put a little radio transmitter, just like your Bluetooth or your Wi-Fi and your cell phone, a tiny little chip so that you have your skin completely as normal and your hair completely as normal work. Cosmesis is really important as well. The final step is that only when we wish to record from these signals in the laboratory or at the person's home do we walk up and put a small amplifier unit so we can pick up these very small signals and make them larger, send them to a computer where we decode. And again, this is the whole thing that I was saying will very soon be fully possible in individual chips. There's many research groups, many efforts in industry going after this. Now, now that we know how to do it, what should we aim for doing? What should our goals be? Well, if we're talking about interfacing with the computer and other electronic devices, then we need to increase that performance of these uh, intracortical brain computer interfaces with rapid and dexterous behaviors. What are the things that humans can do very rapidly? What are the things that humans can do with dexterous behaviors, okay? And the reason I phrase it that way is that a lot of the basic research come from non-human primates where we've learned a lot of lessons. But when you start working with people, when you start working with individual patients who express needs and desires, it shifts your way of thinking to the point that we really want to capitalize on what it means to actually be human. This scale shows from left to right the number of words per minute that are possible with existing systems to help people who cannot communicate, like SIF sip and puff interfaces and so forth, as well as many points along the axis where uh, it represents uh, handwriting speed, speech, and speech of course is the very fastest way we have to communicate. So that's a major goal on the horizon by several groups around the world. What the red dot shows is a recent example of the highest performance of just thinking about moving a computer cursor on a screen and having it do so, and I'll show you a couple of movies of this, and that's able to achieve a roughly eight words per minute typing rate. And the second quick uh, vignette of videos that I'll show you is from a recent paper where we had people attempt to handwrite, and then we could decode those individual letters and use those to type, and there we were able to more than double the speed, up to around 17 or 18 words per minute. But still, lying far out to the right, we believe, is speech, where current systems are able to pick up on signals on the surface of the brain and select from dictionaries in, on the order of tens or hundreds of words. What our goal is, is to understand how individual neurons are related to speech and then be able to speak any word you wish, a so-called open vocabulary. This is a very cluttered diagram that I do not expect to go through in full detail other than to show you all the steps that are really involved so that you don't feel as though there's anything mysterious. It's all actual measured signals and math, okay? The signals come out of the electrode implant and then there's some filtering that's done to remove some noise. There's some uh, estimation of what that signal means in the so-called decoding block shown in green. And then those signals are used to move, for example, the white computer cursor 
in front of this participant, T5, who unfortunately uh, has amyotropic lateral sclerosis, or ALS, and therefore is unable to move either arm or leg. Now, how well can we enable her to type on a screen? Here, you can see the electrode array has been plugged into during this session. She's sitting in front of a computer screen where we have all the letters of the alphabet shown. And then we ask her a question. You know, how did you get your children to practice music? And here's how it works. So she is attempting to move her right hand, left, right, up or down, okay? And we don't really know what we mean when we say, well, I've attempted to move, we just move. But if you think in that way, it's very straightforward to attempt to move left and right, up or down, even when your arm can't move. And that's what controls the 2D position of the cursor. Now, when she wishes to click on a signal, meaning select it and have the character turn blue and then copied up above where it's typing, she attempts to squeeze her left hand and move her wrist, okay? Signals like this can be used as a click signal. And what we were able to achieve is a very fast typing rate. Now, the way you really measure typing rate is to say, here is a sentence, when the sunlight shines, raindrops in the air, uh, strikes raindrops in the air, and we ask her to type it. So now I'm zooming in on the characters, and now she knows what she needs to type, so there's no slowdown thinking about what you want to say, there's just typing. And this is where this current system, as shown here, which is shown in real time as per the digital clock, achieves about 32 correct characters per minute. Meaning if you hit the wrong letter, just like you or I on a keyboard, we then hit the delete key. Now this is repeatable across different participants. That was T5. I will show you another participant, T6. And that's uh, the participant that really um, showed how the handwriting work could work. Okay, so it's repeatable and it's reliable for years. Now, before moving forward to the handwriting prosthetic, can we just get a tablet computer off the internet? Uh, so we ordered one from Amazon, Nexus 9 tablet, running standard Android 5 operating system. We didn't change a single thing. And here, for the very first time, we allowed word completion and prediction to kick in. Previously, we were just focused on raw performance. And here's how she did. So she's looking at a tablet, but we render the tablet larger on the screen so it's easier to see. And she's an avid gardener. And so naturally, she wants to see uh, some information about orchids. And so she does a search and finds a menu. And if you note, these are very small letters, so she has very fine control. We did not turn on accessibility mode to make everything much larger, because we really wanted to push the precision and accuracy of the system. Well, like you or me confronted with a big wall of text, she said, ah, I think what I want actually are some images. So <laughs> it goes back uh, on Google search, hits the image button, sees some pictures of orchids, and then selects the one that she wants to see. And of course, we can always ask, did you select the right one or was that an error? And invariably, it's the correct one. So finally, we can use these same signals to drive not just web browsing, but a whole range of different options. Musical keyboards. She also loves typing uh, uh, on, a key, uh, on a piano, meaning uh, playing keys and producing music. So here you can see her moving selecting keys, of course we'd like it to go more quickly, but it shows the wide range of possibilities. Anything that you can do on a tablet, you can now do. Now, in the remaining few moments here, I want to share with you some very recent work, okay, by uh, Dr. Frank Willett in our group, where we really focused in on handwriting, okay? And if we have a person attempt to write letters, H-E-L-L-O space W, like hello world, uh, 
we can read out those signals, we think, but it's never been done before with the same electrode arrays because now we're decoding the trajectory and motion of the fingertips. And then we could type on the screen the letters H-E-L-L-O. -L -O. We're not trying to reconstruct penmanship, the exact way in which you write the letter H. We just want to know, was it an H or was it a Q or any other letter? So we can type just like we would on a keyboard. So the way we approached this was to put in two electrode arrays in the so-called hand and finger area of the motor cortex. And we started by asking the person to attempt to write the letter A, then the, another random letter, another random letter, and so forth, and did this a bunch of times to collect this neural data. And then we trained a recurrent neural network, meaning machine learning, artificial intelligence algorithms, and what we could do is we could first say, well, do we stand a chance of doing this? If so, we should be able to roughly reconstruct the actual letter, but as seen through decoding the brain. And indeed, that's what we were able to see. So here are the 26 letters of the English alphabet, A, B, C, and so forth. And the fact that you can discern them is highly encouraging. But again, our goal is not to reconstruct a perfect A or B or C. It's simply to tell an A and a B and a C from each other. And that turns out to be very possible as shown here because we can have the person type or attempt to handwrite, I mean, uh, all the different letters of the alphabet several times. Each time gets a little dot, like the S has uh, several dots and the O has several dots and we can tell these apart. So this is in a neural state space when you see this distinct clustering, it means you can tell those categories apart, just like different clusters of stars in the night sky. And that is really the smoking gun evidence that we need to go build the full system. And let me describe that to you now. So as you're writing a word, for example, paper, we record the individual action potentials, the individual electrical pulses from about 200 neurons across time and in very short, brief duration time bins of about 20 milliseconds, as shown by the little rectangle, we're able to read out information, feed it through our trained recurrent neural network machine learning algorithm, and what comes out are the probabilities at each moment in time of wanting to type a different letter, an A or a B or a C. And in this case, we can just put a threshold and say, oh, well, the raw output is T N E paper. Well, I don't know what T N E paper is. I think it is probably the paper. And indeed, this was a slight error. The N should have been H, but those letters are pretty close. So it makes sense that we could confuse them. We're able to do very well. I'll show you that on the next slide, but we can do even better because of modern machine learning. We have access, of course, to language models, meaning very easy, publicly available databases of tens of thousands of words and all the probabilities that one letter follows every other letter. And we can use that information together with the neural information coming out of the brain uh, to intersect the two, as shown here in this Viterbi search, and then it'll correct the error. It'll say, well, T and E is very unlikely. I bet that's a T-H-E because I can see that makes sense, the paper. So this again is almost a symbiosis with the computer in the sense of a word checker, a word speller as we're always used to, or grammar checker and so forth. How well could this work? Well, here's the results across one week. It's very natural to ask a person to attempt to write letters, and we're able to achieve about 90 characters per minute, okay? And that more than doubles our prior record with the on-screen keyboard computer cursor typing rate of about 40. The error rate is about 5%, meaning we could get 95% of the letters correct, but 5% wrong. When we added that language model I described, the error rate went from 5% down to 0.5%. So there's huge improvements that are still possible. Here's a movie showing it all working. This is our participant T6, who has an upper spinal cord injury, again, unable to move his legs or his arms. 
You can see that we have two electrode arrays where we've plugged in just for the experiment. Those go away for the rest of the day. He's seeing his sentence on screen, and then he's typing it by attempting to write each individual letter. So let's take a look at how this works. Again, this is playing in real time. So this is what 90 characters per minute, or about 17, 18 words per minute looks like. And it appears sort of just magically appearing on the screen. If you look at his hand, his hand is not moving. He is just thinking of writing those letters. We're able to understand the language of the brain well enough to do this. That's just the tip of the iceberg. When we really understand the brain through neuroscience in the coming decades, we should be able to do much better in a wider variety of tasks. So in conclusion, we believe that intracortical brain-computer interfaces that decode brain activity from the brain are really advancing quite rapidly. And this is enabled by new neuroscience, new low-power electronics, and a whole variety of other information systems technologies. The second is that these new IBCIs that guide computer cursors in two dimensions or even three dimensions that could be used for arms and so forth are able to really perform much better than previously thought where the movies that I showed you are roughly twice as fast and accurate as previously and again these are enabled by the same advances and finally the new handwriting IBCIs again doubles performance and it's able to do so by understanding the neuroscience of individual finger movements how to decode those signals with really state-of-the-art machine learning algorithms that are rev revolutionizing a large part of the world. And finally, the most important slide that I ever show uh, is the wonderful students and postdocs and staff and collaborators, current, recent past, and alumni that have really worked tirelessly to try to help restore quality of life to people who are suffering. Thank you.